All right, so we are going to read chapters 27 and 28. They are pretty short. Here we go. Um, this is an official handbill um, issued by General George Washington to New Yorkers in August 1776. It said, persons exposed to great danger and hazard remove with all expedition out of the said town, New York, whereas a bombardment and attack may hourly expected. And we are on Monday, August 26th through Saturday, September 14th, 1776. The British thrashed the Patriots in a big battle in Brooklyn, thrashed them, but good. They killed or captured near a thousand rebels and sent the rest scurrying away. After the worst of the battle, the skies opened up again and we all waited, us in a house with leaking windows and a damp parlor, the soldiers in open fields and muddy ditches for the rain to stop. Madame wore a groove in the floor, pacing back and forth, awaiting news of the final British victory, her footsteps tipping and tapping in measure with the ticking of the clock. I poked at the logs in the kitchen hearth, trying to summon back the bees so they would chase out the thoughts invading my brain, brain pan. But the words of the bald man echoed. Would the British truly free me? Should I flee to them? What about Ruth? Would they help me find her? The firewood was wet and green and would not catch. It smoldered and smoked and made a terrible stink. When morning came, a thick fog smothered New York, the kind mama called a pea super. When the fog finally lifted, the American army was not to be found. Washington's men had spent the dark night and foggy morning rowing all of the troops back to New York Island. Some 9,000 men, folks said, that Washington was a conjure man for sure. Madame took to her bed when Becky brought back the news. I muttered a quiet, last and continued to eat my dinner, porridge with dried apple. Becky didn't hear me. She was going on and on about the nasty things she'd passed by at the campgrounds. And there was this one lad, oh, he had his hand blown clean off and a grubby bandage wrapped around his wrist. And I looked at that and I said to myself, that arm's coming off next young man. And maybe your leg for good measures on, measure on account of a noxious pestilence that filled the air, the stench of the place and the groans and moans. She shivered with gruesome delight. If I had a stronger stomach, I'd take a nurse job and help a bit with the washing of the wounds and the like. But with this heat and the flies, you just know the wounds will be maggoty by morning. And if there's one thing I can't abide, it's the sight of maggots and living flesh. I looked in my bowl, the dried apple bits curled like fresh hatched maggots. I stopped eating. Becky ladled out her own meal. They're all saying that this proves the Lord himself is on the side of the rebellion on account of that fog he created. Did the same thing for them back in Boston, blew in a thick mist so the American army could win, win the day. It seemed to me that if God really wanted the Americans to win, he would have sent sea monsters devour, to devour the fleet when he left Boston. As I went to empty my porridge into the scraps bucket, Becky pointed to her own bowl. I filled it with my leftovers and commanded my belly to stop flopping so at the sight of the curly apples. Becky paused with her spoon in the air. Makes a body wonder though, what, I asked. Washington had them melt down the church bells and remake them into cannons. That will surely displease the Lord, I say. If God switches sides and allows the British to take New York, you'll see me headed for Jersey, back to pay or no back pay, back pay or no back pay. I'm not sitting here waiting to get carved into pieces by them beastly redcoats. It took me eight days of slow trips to the market and the water pump before I finally spied Curzon working with other men to set up a filthy tent in the mud of the battery campgrounds. It was good to see him not dead nor chopped up. Chapter 28. Um, this is from the diary of William Smith, Chief Justice of the Province of New York. The clouds grow very dark. The true invasion of New York started with the firing of a hundred ships cannons when we were at church Sunday morning. The first blast made the women shriek. The second blast made me wonder if God himself was fixed to blow the island apart. The third blast caused us to run for the door. Rebel soldiers were dashing every which direction on the street, muskets in their hands, officers bellowing loud. The horses pulling carts and carriages whinnied nervously, bobbing their heads up and down, rolling their eyes in fear of the commotion and noise. The cannons roared again, 
The sound was coming from the East River side of the island to the north. I searched the skies for flaming comets, for that was how I pictured a cannonball would look. All I saw were startled birds and campfire smoke. The city itself seemed unharmed, though fear ran neck deep. Madame reached out and grabbed at the coat of an officer striding toward the battery fort. He whirled a curse on his lips, but caught himself when he realized he was speaking to a lady. Does this unholy racket mean the arrival of the war? Madame asked. Yes, ma'am, the officer said, but you need not be afraid. The generals have the matter well in hand. He hesitated as the cannons roared again. Civilians should go home and lock your doors. Do not peer out of windows. Madame contemplated him coolly. What are those men doing? She asked, pointing to the campground. The soldiers were quickly assembling their guns, ammunition, whatever they could stuff into their sacks. They moved so fast you'd have thought the ground was afire. We are preparing to meet the army, the enemy, he said. You are running away, she said. No, ma'am, he said as he started to move away from her. We're moving up to Fort Washington to guard the King's Bridge. He shouted to be heard as a wagon pulled by four horses raced by. We must follow orders. Indeed, Madame said. Becky had the Sabbath off, so I served Madame her meal of cold pork, peas, and onions cooked with sage. She was calm about finally having war at her doorstep and thousands of riled up menfolk marching with guns. In fact, as she ate, she kept a sheet of paper, a quill, and an ink bottle by the side of her plate and would from time to time jot down a word or two. When her plate was empty, she spoke to me direct. I am preparing a list of items for you to purchase. You may leave as soon as the dishes are washed. Beg pardon, ma'am? I need you to go down to the shops. I've no doubt Elihu will soon return home and I'd like to celebrate with a suitable meal. It's a shame that turtles are so hard to come by here. Elihu loves turtle soup. Had she lost her mind? But the cannons, ma'am, I started. The battle, surely it will be a few days before. Most of the items can be purchased at Mr. Mason's. She dipped the quill and scratched out another item. He's a thieving rat of a man, but he's loyal to the king. I know he's been hoarding his best wares. She paused as cannon fire boomed again from the north. I don't know why the rebels don't just surrender. They cannot win. I froze at the sideboard. The words of the bald-headed man came to me. If the British win, we'll all be free. Could it be so simple? Might the invaders liberate me from this nightmare? What, was this my chance? Madame said something, but I couldn't make out her words. Yes, ma'am, I mumbled, my hands doing the work of a slave, my mind racing free. I will run and join the British. The thought washed over me like a river, sweeping away the dead bees that had filled my brain pan with confusion. The answers tumbled one after another. They'd grant me freedom and give me work. I'd save my money and make my way to Nevis and rescue Ruth. Plain, simple, and true. Are you deaf? Madame Scald scolded me. I'd been staring at the door and not minding her words. She shook the paper in her hand. I said, take this to Mason. If he can't supply you with everything, he'll direct you where to go. I'll be going home, I thought, and you can fetch your own food and empty your own chamber pot and carry your own blasted firewood from this day forward. Girl, Madame squinted at me and tilted her head to one side. Are you feverish? I gave thanks that she could not hear my thoughts. No, ma'am, I put the list in my pocket and set the last knife on the tray. I'm strong as can be. I'll go to Mr. Mason's directly. I paused at the parlor door. I may be delayed a wee bit, ma'am, I said with care. What would the commotion and all? A dozen or so soldiers dashed down the middle of the street, their boots thudding. It cannot be helped, Madame said with a sigh. Walking down Broadway, I was a fish swimming in the wrong direction. Everyone else in New York flowed north and fought against my progress. Continental troops in ragged formation, militia units carrying packs and haversacks, small artillery pieces pulled by horses and carts weighed down with women and children. The noise was deafening. Along with the shouts of men and women, every dog in the city was barking alarm. Pigs squealed underfoot and occasionally a musket would fire, which led to shouted oaths and yelps. Drums beat and fifes blew and beneath everything was a steady clockwork blast of British cannons firing at the troop station north of us. I kept to the fronts of buildings, ducking into doorways when necessary until I finally took refuge in the abandoned Chandler's shop. The door was locked, but the front windows had been smashed to bits when the owner was tarred and feathered some weeks previous. I crawled through the window, taking care not to cut myself on the glass shards jutting out of the frame. I set my basket on the floor. Ruth's doll rested inside it under her bag. That was the one thing I could not leave behind. The shop smelled musty and damp and the shelves stood empty. 
all the candles and other goods were stolen the day they ran the Chandler out of town. It was a gloomy place, but what would serve well as a temporary shelter. I stood by the window and watched the tide of people roll out of the city. Hurry, I silently urged them, hurry. I also urged the British army. I did not want them to land right away, not until the last of the crowd had fled, but it would be nice if they arrived right quick after that, before Madame could hire someone to seek me out. Finally, the crowd thinned and cartwheels could be heard echoing up the road. I waited a little longer just to be sure. A few Continentals dashed by, their hands holding their hats on their heads and canteens and cartridge cases banging against their backsides. They were followed by a rough looking militia unit that was trailed by a group of slaves carrying shovels and pickaxes. I searched for a familiar red hat, but, not, but did not find it. When the air fell still with just a few voices calling orders in the distance, I hiked up my skirts and crawled out through the window. Ah, tough spot to stop at. Um, but go ahead, re-listen, reread, jot your notes, come up with some talking points, and we will talk about these two chapters tomorrow. Thank you for listening.